Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to our medical director, Dr. Brian Wood, to introduce our guest. Well, we are very lucky to have Dr. Matt Golden back with us today for another talk. Dr. Golden is professor of medicine here at UW and director of Public Health Seattle King County's HIV STD control program. Dr. Golden is going to talk to us today about a very important issue, uh, emerging resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea. I will turn it over to Matt. Well, it's nice to be here. I gave a talk here a while ago, but it's been a few years. So I'm going to talk, uh, what I thought I'd do is briefly go over the epidemiology of antimicrobial resistance and gonorrhea, and then talk about the implications for testing and treatment related to that. Now, a lot of you have probably seen a slide like this at some point in the past. This is just showing you sort of the history of antimicrobial resistance and gonorrhea. Uh, the original treatment for gonorrhea in the 1930s was uh, sulfonamides. Uh, the drug, uh, the bug quickly became resistant to sulfonamides, but by the mid-1940s, we had penicillin, and penicillin was a great therapy for over four decades. So the bug became progressively more resistant, but we were able to effectively respond by increasing doses of penicillin until the mid-1970s, at which point penicillinase-producing gonorrhea became widespread, and subsequently that was dropped. Now, at that point, we had ceftriaxone, and that became the mainstay of therapy. And we then had a brief experience using quinolones and then subsequently suffixine. And I think the quinolones are really an instructive example of what happens with gonorrhea resistance. So here what you're looking at is the prevalence of quinolone-resistant Neisseria gonorrhea in Asia in 1996. And at that time, there was almost no quinolone resistance in the United States, less than 1%. But you can see, even by then, in places like the Philippines, 70% of these microorganisms were already quinolone resistant. And what happens is, in general, gonococcal resistance comes from Asia to us. So what you're looking at here, uh, and my animation didn't work, but on the red line, that's gonococcal res or quinolone resistance in China. You can see, again, by the mid-1990s, by 1990s, widespread. The green line at the bottom is the U.S. as a whole. But that sort of light blue line is Honolulu. And what the bug does is it goes across from Asia to Hawaii. Then it goes to Southern California, that dark blue line. After that, it hits, goes up the I-5 corridor, hits Seattle. And from there, again, these, some of these lines are showing you, unfortunately, again, my animation doesn't work. It leapfrogs country, goes to the East Coast, hits Philadelphia, Miami, then slowly crosses into the Midwest. And, you know, if you went to Kansas, they're still probably susceptible to penicillin or something. Both cases every year, <laughs> right? So this, this pattern of antimicrobial resistance and its spread that we're concerned about. Now, what about this suffixing? So here what you're seeing is the emergence of decreased susceptibility to oral cephalosporins in Japan. So in 1999, there was no suffixing. By 2001, a quarter of their isolates were suffixing resistant, and they were, these same bugs had high levels of resistance to quinolones, to penicillin, and to tetracyclines. And that has been sustained in Japan since that time. Well, how did the gonococcus do it? So at the risk of giving you guys PTSD, you'll remember from your micro class that there are three main mechanisms of bacterial horizontal gene transfer. So one is going to be conjugation bridges. So remember the transfer of plasmids from one bacteria to another. The gonococcus can do this. That's how we got penicillinase resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. That's not a big factor in what we're seeing now with suffixing. There's transduction, which is with bacteriophages, those viruses that affect bacteria. That's not an issue here. What's happening is called transformation. And that's that the gonococcus is competent to uptake free DNA from other Neisseria species. And that's what's explaining what's happening probably with the changes related to uh, suffixing. So basically what seems to happen is initially was the observation of gonococci that have these mosaic-like structures. What they did is they took up DNA sequences for resistance from other commensal Neisseria, in this case, Cinerea uh, and Perflava which inhabit the oral pharynx. And that oral pharynx is sort of an incubator of gonococcal resistance, where the gonococci can take up these resistance mutations. 
So this is in 2010, what had happened with those original mosaic-like bacteria that were resistant to suffixing. We were up to 9% resistant across Western Europe with numerous countries showing greater than 10% resistance. So really widespread suffixing resistance. Now in the United States, it wasn't as widespread and it was very concentrated in the Western United States. So in 2011, about 5% of the isolates in men who had sex with men had these high MICs to suffixing, about 2% in men who had sex with women. And these do appear to be clinically significant. So these data come from a study in JAMA in 2003 from Toronto, looking at microorganisms here with MICs of 0.125 or higher. So actually not quite at the level of decreased susceptibility. But even among those bugs, 25% of people who were treated with suffixime alone, or mostly suffixime alone, failed therapy. Now I'd point out here in this study, almost nobody received concurrent azithromycin. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. Now what about ceftriaxone? That's the really worrisome possibility. So far I've been talking about suffixing, the oral cephalosporin. Well here you're looking at in intermediate cef ceftriaxone susceptibility in China. And I think you can all appreciate this big increase over the period of the last decade or so in these relatively resistant microorganisms. They're not truly resistant, but they have elevated MICs. In Europe it's about 15%, in the United States less than 5%. So again, we're relatively protected. And then the most worrisome possibility at all, and maybe you guys have heard about these superbugs. So we have three uh, reports to date of extensively drug-resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. And these are bugs that are actually resistant, truly resistant to ceftriaxone. So again, first start in Japan. I'd make a couple points about these. They all have this mosaic-like structure. So they have this backbone, which is clonal, from Japan. But then on top of it, in order to become ceftriaxone resistant, they had to acquire additional resistance mutations. And here, their lineage diverges. So it seems like what's happened is they start out with a common background, but we're seeing the development of multiple multi-drug multi resistant bugs out there around the world. Certainly very worrisome. So in response to all this, there's kind of a frenzy. And you guys probably heard about it from CDC, from WHO, from the European community. And then this is what happened. So the prevalence of these decreased susceptibility bugs plummets in 2011, and it's continued to go down. Now, the UK is saying, uh, we did it. It was that we stopped using suffixing and we gave ceftriaxone. Could be. Hard to say. We have not had a decreased susceptibility isolate in King County now for 18 months. And there was data presented at ISSTDR this summer that these bugs are kind of wimps. So they don't re replicate as efficiently as the wild type bugs. So hard to know exactly what's driving this decrease, but it is ongoing even in 2012 in Europe as well. So, so far I've been focusing on the epidemiology here. What are our roles as clinicians? Well, I think one big issue is we really need to identify and treat the reservoir of asymptomatic infections in men who have sex with men, particularly pharyngeal and rectal infections. So about a third of men and women with urogenital infections, or gay men and women with urogenital infections are gonna have concurrent pharyngeal infections. So when you treat a gay man or a woman for gonorrhea, you should be assuming if you didn't test the oral pharynx, there's an extremely high likely that the oral pharynx is infected. And so your therapy needs to have that in mind. Among gay men who we would see in our clinic who don't have concurrent urethral infections and are asymptomatic, 8% are going to have gonorrhea either in their pharynx or their rectum. So an extremely high prevalence of gonorrhea in one of these two asymptomatic, relatively isolated sites. So really emphasizes the importance of screening those sites. And I'd point out that the pharyngeal infections are much harder to treat. So we don't achieve the kinds of drug levels that we want there. Well, fortunately, we have some options. So this slide is showing you the relative sensitivity of culture in red and aptum, which is a nucleic acid amplification test in yellow. And I think what you can very clearly appreciate is these nucleic acid amplification tests are way, way more sensitive than culture. Now, in terms of specificity, the aptum combo 2 test appears to be extremely specific. The COBOS PCR, which is the Roche product, 
in the past has been extremely nonspecific, but they recently introduced a new assay. And I think at this point, we really don't know how that one's going to perform. The Beck and Dickinson assay, which is called Probe Tech or SDA's strand displacement assay, probably mostly works pretty well, but the data are a little bit uh, conflicting. So it's important for all of you to know what assay you're using when you are ordering these tests with nucleic acid amplification tests. Mind you, none of these are FDA approved yet. So a lot of labs, including places like LabCorp, have gone through that internal validation and it should be available to you, but it depends, again, a little on where you're getting your lab tests. Now here you're looking at self-obtained nucleic acid amplification tests versus clinician obtained. And the big point here is the patients can do a really good job of obtaining these specimens themselves. So you don't need to spend a lot of time doing this. In our STD clinic, the standard now is the patients are taking their own butt swabs and to a substantial extent their pharyngeal swabs, and we're moving toward that increasingly at Madison Clinic as well. And this is just showing you uh, the sensitivity and specificity. I won't belabor this, but these really, these really do look good. Now here you can see is our uh, test yourself guidance. And I, I think, have you guys had that sent out to you already? We can certainly send it out to you. We have another one for the oral pharynx. Uh, just to emphasize, you know, some instruction materials for the patient. They really are capable of doing this on their own. Uh, and most patients, I think, actually, if anything, prefer it, particularly for the butt swab. Now, in terms of treatment, the CDC is currently recommending ceftraxin 250 milligrams plus azithro or doxy but the evidence favors azithro, not doxy. So if you look at this table I've made for you here, what you're looking at is observational data from our clinic, which we published in CID earlier this year, looking at pharyngeal GC. And the point I would make is just, you can see combination with azithro had a treatment failure rate or a current positivity of 7%, which was similar to ceftriaxone combination or alone, but way better than combinations with doxycycline or cephalosporine, oral cephalosporine monotherapy. So the azithromycin addition is buying you quite a bit here. The doxy azithro appears to be buying you nothing. So I would really emphasize azithro is our second drug, not doxy. How about other options? Well, we could give you just more ceftriaxone. Uh, the Europeans have raised their uh, treatment to 500 milligrams instead of our 250. The Japanese are using a gram uh, IV. Uh, there's really not a lot of evidence for that one way or the other. Uh, we could give more suffixing. I think there is still a need for oral therapies. Uh, we, the PK modeling suggests that multi-doses of higher doses should work, and we actually have a study ongoing right now we're doing in collaboration with Hopkins, doing a formal PK study to try to get at this. Genomycin is a potential option. So genomycin alone has been used in Malawi for a long time. It's 91% effective as a standalone drug, and you look across studies. The CDC recently presented data of uh, looking at gent plus two grams of azithro. Everyone was cured. Of course, almost everyone would be cured with two grams of azithro alone. Uh, it's so hard to know, uh, but that's an option. There's also a drug called salithromycin. So that's not FDA approved yet. It's a macrolide antibiotic. It has much higher activity than azithro uh, for gonococci. It has additional binding sites, so it appears to be effective against azithro-resistant microorganisms. Uh, we did a phase two trial in collaboration with Alabama. Everybody who received the salithro was cured. So we'll see if that goes into a phase three trial, uh, and that may be an option in the future as well. So in terms of conclusions, I would say uh, that the decreased susceptibility in Neisseria gonorrhea is a problem. I'm not trying to diminish it that. How imminent a problem it is, I'm not sure. I think gay men are likely to be the leading edge of antimicrobial resistant gonorrhea, and that means you guys are going to be seeing these patients. Uh, we do want to increase screening of extragenital sites. I think that this is going to have to rely on NATS and self-obtained specimens. And for, we do want to push dual therapies, particularly with ceftriaxone, azithromycin, not ceftriaxone, doxy, is our preferred regimen.